Once again, Cedar Street, I love you so much. I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that of all the years that I've been with you, this week more so than many, maybe any other in the last eight years, God has been pouring out to me with words to share with you today. And I, I'm, even when we're, he's reading the psalm and we're singing, I'm still jotting down. I had, my, I had those Frankie Hodges moments, right? When, wasn't it Frankie that... Uh, constantly was writing and writing and writing before the sermon was preached. Well, God has just turned a faucet on and he can't, he hasn't turned it off. So I'm just um, filled with joy to be here to share with you a very tough topic on a very important week. Because I believe God has a word for everybody in this room today. And I'm going to move at a pretty good pace. If you're a note taker, go ahead and do this right now. This is one of those messages that you're probably going to have to go back and listen to a few times to get maybe what God has for you, because I'm going to cover a lot of ground, because everybody in this room is in a different situation. Because as we head towards Thanksgiving, I want to prepare you to enter into this where you are, right where you are, and meet God there. The title of my message here this morning is Thankful Thoughts in Ever-Changing Times. Thankful Thoughts in Ever-Changing Times. We're going to look at one verse And out of that one verse, we're going to look at all of Scripture and from Genesis to Revelation, how God has told us we can obey this one verse. As we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. But I want to begin by talking about one undeniable truth that every single one of us denies every week, sometimes every day. There's one undeniable truth of reality. You don't even have to be a Christian to acknowledge this truth. Yet you and I, in our actual walk, our actual decision-making every day, we deny this truth. The truth is this. In this world, there are things that you can control, and there are things that you can't control. Now, we would all acknowledge that, right? That we live in a world where there's things that we cannot control, and there's things that we can but then we spend the rest of our days trying to control the uncontrollable. We try to control the uncontrollable. When we try to control the uncontrollable and we deny that there's some things that we simply cannot control, guess what happens? We lead to down roads of anxiety and worry and grief. But when we accept the truth that there's some things that we simply cannot control, we can experience peace and rest and a greater trust in the God who is in control. Now, what is it that we can't control? Hear me clearly. You cannot control the outcomes of your life. You cannot control them. You can influence them. All right? We don't sit still and do nothing. All right? But we can't control them. What are the outcomes that we wish that we could control that we can't? Well, our health, our wealth, our reputation, our relationships, our achievements, our safety, and even our death. You are not in control of any single one of those things. Now, you can influence those things, right? As far as your health, you can get good sleep, diet, and exercise. As far as your wealth, you can make good investments. As far as your reputation, you can have a good character. With your relationships, you can invest and sacrificially serve others. With your achievements, you can prepare and work hard. With your safety, you can have good insurance. Uh, With your death, you can stay away from things that are life-threatening. You can do all the right things and still not have the outcomes that you desire. But what are the things that you can control? Well, you can control your perspective on each of those outcomes. If you're putting your trust and faith in a God who loves you and is working all things together for good. All right, you can't control what happens, but you can control your perspective that God is in control. And I want to say this because I think it's often misunderstood. Even among faithful Christians, we don't understand suffering. And we're very confused by it. And because we don't understand what God's doing in it, we make it worse instead of making it better and entering into what it is that God wants us to learn in the process. I'm convicted about it in my own life. I'm convicted about it as your pastor and as your friend. Because you see, faith is about trust. We cannot use our faith to control God and do what we want him to do. 
And I hear even faithful Christians say, if I just have enough faith, he's going to do this, this, and this. No, that's not how it works. Faith is not about controlling God. Faith is about surrendering control to God and trusting that he will do what is best. And so because of that, because of that, if we can truly relinquish control, we can be thankful to a good God no matter what happens to us in our life. Because that's exactly what Paul's going to tell us to do. As we uh, look at 1 Thessalonians 5.18, here's our big idea in one sentence. A true mark of Christian maturity is when we learn to have thankful thoughts in all of our ever-changing times. A true mark of Christian maturity is when we learn to have thankful thoughts in all of our ever-changing times. And we're going to look at a lot of of situations where you and I can learn to be thankful, the good, the bad, and everything in between. So if you want to know this call to be thankful in all situations and circumstances, would you join me by turning to the book of 1 Thessalonians? 1 Thessalonians is after Colossians. It's before 2 Thessalonians. It's on page 1174 in your pew Bible. And if you would stand at this time, out of the reverence of the reading of God's holy, infallible, Inerrant and fully sufficient word. I'm not going to make you stand for long. We got one verse. All right, this whole, I, this whole passage, I wish I had weeks to preach this whole passage. Maybe one day I will. But we're going to look at just one verse. And like South Georgia barbecue, we're going to cook it low and slow. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. Hear God's word to us through his servant, the Apostle Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit of God. This is what he wants for us on Thanksgiving. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Father, I thank you for the time that we've spent together this week because I believe that you have such a passion and a love for everybody in this room that you've got a word for each of us. There's a lot of wonderful gifts that you're giving us and a lot of trials that you've enabled us to enter into, Lord. And I pray that you would help us this morning and in the days ahead to meet you in both the good gifts and the tough trials because they're both coming in every direction. Lord, I pray that I pray in a very special way today that you would cast out distractions, that we would be fully present in this moment that you would quiet me and my voice in such a way that when they hear words, they hear it directly from you and apply it directly to their own hearts. Have your way with us here today, Lord. Help us cultivate in us a heart of trust and a tongue of thanksgiving in every single circumstance that we are in because we know that you are at work and you are producing good out of all things to those who love you. So help us to enter into this, Lord. It's a good time to be thankful, but we can't do it without your help. So be with us now, I pray. In Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. amen. All right, so we're in 1 Thessalonians. I just want to mention this very, very quickly. Again, I wish uh, there will be some day, maybe I'll go verse by verse through the whole book, but I'll just make a summary statement of 1 Thessalonians. The church at Thessalonica was a church on fire for Jesus. There was just one problem. They were so ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ that many in the church quit their jobs, and they were basically staring into the sky saying he could come at any moment. And the Apostle Paul addresses the second coming of Jesus throughout the entire book of 1 Thessalonians. And he's basically saying, I love the fact that you're ready for Jesus to come back, but this is not a time to sit on our hands and look up at the sky. We got work to do, and we better be busy about the kingdom of God. That's a good summary of 1 Thessalonians. And so put in the context what we just read in chapter 5, verse 18. He's saying to the church, and he's saying to us today, because I hope today in this church, you're ready for the second coming of Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, ought to be the cry of every single heart in this room. Until he comes, we've got to be busy, but at the same time, we can be thankful. No matter what you see in the news, no matter what you get in a doctor's report, no matter what the Dow Jones says, no matter what somebody said about you on social media, if you came into this room today, you have an opportunity to thank and praise God because every single thing that is happening, he is working it together for our good 
and for his glory. Now, how do I tackle all circumstances in 19 minutes? Uh, Close to impossible. So I'm just going to give you bookends. And the bookends that I'm going to give you, because everybody in this room is a combination of both, okay? The bookends that I'm going to give you are good gifts and tough trials. Good gifts and tough trials. And I don't care how good things are in your life. You're either going into a trial, you're, in, you're coming out of a trial, or God's getting you ready for the next one. And I don't care what trial you're in, how awful it is, you are, you are in the midst of receiving gifts from God that are good and precious gifts, and you may not even see them because you're blinded by the suffering that you're experiencing. So good gifts and tough trials, guess who it applies to? Every single person in this room. And so the question is, what are the thoughts that we need to have in each of these situations? Because everything starts with our mind. That's why the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Heads, hearts, and hands being transformed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It always starts with the mind before it makes it to the heart and the tongue and, of course, the hands. All right, so good gifts. What are good gifts? Good gifts are things that God decides to give us to prosper us. I don't know if you know this, but we have a good God who gives good gifts. And why does he give us good gifts? Before we walk into this, I'll just say three ways, the three reasons that God gives us good gifts. Sometimes it's a reward. Sometimes it's a refreshment. Sometimes it's a reminder. Sometimes it's a reward. God is still in the business of blessing obedience. Do you know that? Now, sometimes it's not immediate, But there could be a season where you are following the Lord and you don't see it right away, but then God decides to reward your faithfulness with a wonderful gift. And it's a gift to be enjoyed. Sometimes God knows that you need refreshment. You've been in a dry and weary place where there is no water. And so God decides to give you this unexpected gift to encourage and refresh your soul. And then sometimes it's a reminder. Sometimes it's a reminder of how good he is because we've forgotten it. Sometimes it's a reminder of the power of prayer. We pray and we pray and we pray and God says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to answer that prayer because I'm a God who answers the prayers of, of my faithful people. And so sometimes a good gift is a result of prayer. And so it reminds us and encourages us to pray for everything. Those are good gifts. But then there are tough trials. Why does God enable tough trials to enter into our life? Well, because those trials, they change our pace, our pride, and our perspective. First of all, they change our pace. I don't know if you know this, but there's only one speed that you can truly know and experience and hear God. And that's the speed of stillness. God says, if you want to know me, you need to be still enough to know me. Be still and know that I am God. And oh, sometimes we need a good trial to bring us to an absolute standstill where we can go nowhere and it's just us and God. Sometimes he gives us trials because it's an issue of pride. All of us need to be humbled. And and, and during our trials, when we realize that we are powerless, we realize the blessings that we had in that past season weren't really about us. They were about God. And then sometimes it's perspective. Sometimes we're a little bit too obsessed about uh, all the comfort and pleasure of the moment, and we forget that he's at work producing and preparing us for eternal life. As one author says, we are training for reigning. Do you know that this world is preparation for the world to come? That you and I are going to be entrusted with eternal responsibilities in the new heavens and new earth, and so right now we're on an eternal job interview? Well, sometimes our trials remind us this is not all there is. There's an entire kingdom being built and an eternity to prepare for. And so trials shift us. And I want to say, because this question comes up all the time, what, what's God's purpose and hand in our trials? Let me just say, there are things that God produces, and then there are things that God permits. God is not the author of evil. There is no darkness and evil in him whatsoever. So if you've experienced pain and suffering and you've been uh, attacked by the world, the flesh, or the devil, you need to know that God did not produce that. didn't come from his hand, but he certainly permitted it. Nothing gets past God. We don't need to act as if we're in a moment of suffering and someone's kind of sneaked past God to do that. If you don't believe me, look at the entire book of Job. 
It was suffering from the, the evil hand of Satan, but Satan had to get God's permission. Same applies today. God is not the author of evil, but he permits it. He said, and if you said, no, Bo, God never permits any evil whatsoever, I would say, look at the cross. God permitted the greatest evil that could ever happen to produce the greatest gift that was ever offered. The greatest evil was putting the Son of God on a cross. The greatest good was offering salvation to mankind. So God is not the author of evil. He does not produce evil, but oh, he permits it because he works it together for good. He works it together for good. So let's get right after it. I want to give you a few thoughts for good times, and I want to give you a few thoughts for tough times. And I'm going to give you a scripture verse and a point for each one of these thoughts. And so if you're a note taker, what I would say is just jot down these chapters and verses and go back in your quiet time and meditate on them. Every single thing I'm saying to you is coming right out of the word of God. Okay. All right. So thankful thoughts for good times. Here's your first thought. Good gifts come from a greater father. Good gifts come from a greater father. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Which means every gift should magnify our love for the giver. Everything you have is because a gracious God decided that you should have it. Every single gift, great and small, should point back to God. So give thanks. All right. The second is good gifts are to be properly enjoyed. Properly enjoyed. 1 Timothy 4, verses 4 through 5 says, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. And then in 1 Timothy 6, 17, it says, God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So can I just say this? If God has given you a good gift... Enjoy it. You know, when I first got saved, I didn't understand this. I felt like if I was living a life of self-denial, but I was actually enjoying something, there was something there I didn't deny. I, I've learned as I've grown in the Lord that sometimes a, an act of worship is to greatly enjoy a blessing that he has given you, but you enjoy it in the confines of his standard and his holy word. What do I mean by that? What if your blessing is something material? Well, don't flaunt it, but share it. What if your blessing is food? Enjoy it, but don't gorge on it. What if your blessing is intimacy? Well, enjoy that in the bed of marriage, but never outside of it. You see, everything is enjoyed, but it has to be enjoyed on his terms and not ours. All right, that's the second. Third, good gifts are to be freely shared. I love Luke chapter 6, verse 38. It says, give, and it will be given to you. And you're like, all right, well, God's going to give back to me. Well, he's going to give back to you because you're supposed to enjoy it and share it with other people. It says, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for the measure you use it will be measured back to you. In other words, you are blessed to be a blessing to other people. There is no gift that God has given you that you are supposed to enjoy, and then it stops with you. You've got to receive it with one open hand, and then you've got to share it with that other open hand. That's, that's the design of God's kingdom. All right, now this one's big. This one I did not understand until this past year when I was preaching through Ecclesiastes. This next one is good gifts will be part of our judgment. Good gifts will be part of our judgment. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 9 says, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. You know what that means? If God gives you a good gift, enjoy it for what it was intended for, because if you receive a good gift and you're ungrateful and you don't enjoy it the way God wanted you to enjoy it, that's actually going to be something brought up at the judgment seat. So if you have a good gift... Enjoy it for what it was intended for. Praise him for it. Use it. Share it. Don't worship it. Worship God. But you know what? Let's acknowledge in this room, I don't care how tough your trial is right now, I guarantee there are good gifts that you have not fully enjoyed and you have not fully thanked God for yet. 
in this season. And that leads me to my final point for a thankful thought in good times. Good gifts can refocus our worship of God. Psalm 100 verses 4 through 5 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Again, everything that's enjoyed should point back to God and magnify our enjoyment of him. I mean, let's just play what if, okay? Let's, Let's go to Christmas morning. Let's fast forward a few weeks. It's Christmas morning. And you bless your child, or for some of you, your grandchild, with a wonderful gift under the tree. How could they possibly enjoy it that would magnify your joy as the giver? Well, number one, if they open it and they're not grateful and toss it aside, well, that dishonors you. The same way we dishonor God. But on the other hand, if they take that gift and they love it so much, they tell you to leave them alone and they go in another room and they obsess over it and that gift has actually separated your time with them, well, that also dishonors him. But what if the child opens the gift with tears in their eyes and they enjoy it so much they run to you and wrap their arms around you and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then they call friends in the neighborhood to come over and enjoy it with them. That's what the gift is intended for. So the next time you receive something, respond to God exactly how you want your grandchildren or your children to respond to you on Christmas morning. That is how you thank him with good gifts. Amen? Amen. All right. So far, so good. Now we look at the other side of the coin. This is tough. Hence the term tough times. Thankful thoughts in tough times. You know, it's easy to praise God when the sun is shining. It's very difficult when the clouds come rolling in. But you know what? Suffering is inevitable for everybody in this room. And can I say before I walk through these thoughts that suffering is relative to each person. Sometimes when people are suffering, we don't know what to say. And so we say some of the craziest things. Here's a pastoral uh, tip. Two things never to say when somebody's in a trial. You ready? Number one, I know exactly how you feel. I do not care if you had the exact condition they have. You don't know them. You don't have their feelings. You don't have their family. You don't have their situation. You cannot say, I know exactly how you feel. That completely devalues their experience. But also, don't go so far on the other way to say, I cannot possibly imagine how you feel. It's like saying, you know how you thought it was bad? It's probably worse than you think. Don't say that either. How about this? I love you, and I'm so sorry that you're going through this. And just sit with them. Paul says, weep with those who weep. Right? Suffering is relative. You see two people going through the exact same situation, and one person thinks the world's coming to an end, and the other one is praising God because they know God's at work. You know, my job as a pastor is to help everyone in this room to see that God's at work. Don't waste your trial. Don't waste what God is wanting to show you in this season, because I will tell you this, if you don't get what he's got for you this time around and you get through this trial, well, he's going to bring another one. Not because he doesn't love you, but because he does. You say, well, I don't think God does that. Well, read the book of Exodus. A journey that should have taken less than two weeks took 40 years. Because a lesson was never learned. So let's not waste our trials, but be thankful in them. How do we do that? Well, in the last few minutes, I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. If you think I'm just making this stuff up, you bring your Bible, we'll have a good talk about it. Because we need to understand how to respond in these times. First, tough trials work together for our good. Now, that's a promise specifically for Christians. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. If you're a Christian, God does not waste a single one of your tears. He can actually turn previous mistakes into future blessings. If you enable those mistakes to increase your faith and your service and your trust in God. He's working things together for good. Now, 
I've been, I have this pocket notebook I keep when I feel like God is giving me a word. I, I'm just jotting it down. The other night I was about to go to bed and I leaped over my bed to the nightstand and almost cracked my head open to write this sentence down. I just felt like God gave this to me. Okay? I wrote this entire sentence down. We're not thankful for the trial, but we're thankful in the trial because of what he's producing with the trial. I hope that's a helpful word that came to me at midnight. All right? We don't have to be thankful for the trial. It says be thankful in all things. It doesn't say be thankful for all things. You don't have to say, Lord, thank you for this cancer. Cancer is not good. And you shouldn't thank God for something that's not good. But you know what you can say? Thank you that you are meeting me in this cancer. Thank you that no matter what happens, you're going to bring good out of this. And you are going to prepare for me something I would not have had had I not gone through this. Again, we don't thank him for the trial. We thank him in the trial because of what he's producing with the trial. He's working it together for good. What are are one of the things he's working together for good? Well, the next verse. Tough trials can form us to Christ's image. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Trials mold us and they shape us. I was reading Proverbs 17 in my devotional time this week, and it talked about the crucible. It talked about silver and gold being tested and purified under pressure. If you and I are going to be conformed to the image of Christ, that's not going to happen mostly during prosperity. It's going to happen during trials. Because we're going to stop depending on ourselves. We're going to stop looking at this world as all there is. We're going to begin to trust him in ways that we've never trusted him before. He's producing transformation into the image of his son. And he's also doing, number three, tough trials create dependence on grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, God said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. If you don't know the context, Paul had a thorn in his flesh. And he asked God time after time after time, remove this thorn from me. Now, we don't know what the thorn was. Some think it was declining eyesight. Some people think it was false teachers in Ephesus who were trying to kill his ministry. We do not know what the thorn was. What we do know is this. God said, I'm going to do more keeping that thorn in your flesh than taking it away. So my grace is sufficient for you to remain in this trial because what I'm going to produce out of it is greater than if I just took it away from you. Now to the person that says, if you just have enough faith, he's going to heal you every single time. Guess what? That person has to say, you have to have more faith in the Apostle Paul. I'd be careful. I'd be careful about that. I'd go even further to say in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus himself, knowing he was going to face crucifixion, said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. So to believe you have to have enough faith and God will will redeem you from every pain that you've ever experienced, that means you have to have more faith in Jesus. And I'm definitely not going there. What I would say is this. Yes, pray for the desires of your heart. Yes, pray specifically. Sometimes we have not because we've asked not. Sometimes God is waiting for the prayers of his people to move and do what he desires to do. But just know this, if you have prayed specifically, if you've repented of every known sin in your life, and you continue to pray and God says, I love you, but I'm not removing that thorn from you in this season, It's because he wants you to trust in his grace in a way that you never have before. And that grace is partially trusting in his strength in a way that you've never trusted in his strength before. God, I can't make it another day like this, but I can with you. Sometimes it's even by the hour. Yesterday I was at Loving Hands at their their open house and I talked to those men for three hours. And I talked about living in the strength of God's grace and not trusting in our own strength. And and one of the men there said, yes, sometimes it's not even one day at a time. Sometimes it's one minute at a time. I don't know how I'm going to make it the next hour. But by the grace of God, I will. So I'm going to take it one day at a time, one hour at a time, sometimes even one minute at a time. And that just builds trust and intimacy and the ability to live in his strength and not ours. 
Tr- tough trials also give us an eternal perspective. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 through 18, it says, For this light momentary affliction, fill in the blank any trial that you're dealing with, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. All right, so reverse engineer that statement. He said, the trial that you're going through, if you're being faithful in the midst of the trial, is working for you eternal reward. So if you look at it from backwards to forwards, there's eternal reward that God wants you to have, and you will not have it unless you endure the trial that he's laid right before you. You say, well, maybe I could just enjoy heaven without that reward. You will be grateful when you are there for what he has chosen for you if you surrender to it. If you surrender to it. You know, obviously I love talking about heaven. It's one of my favorite topics. And I read a lot of authors that talk about heaven. There's one common denominator from everyone that loves talking about heaven. They've been greatly hurt on earth. They've been wounded in such a way they realize that their greatest hope can't be on what is here on planet earth that we can enjoy great things, but there's got to be something beyond this world. You show me someone who is hungry for heaven, I'll show you someone who has endured some pretty tough trials on this side of heaven. God changes our perspective. And again, that does not mean that we forsake the good gifts that he gives us here on earth, but it means we enjoy them with open hands because we're not home yet. And this this last one that I'm going to close on is, is, this has been my oxygen for weeks and I want to tell you how I use it in my life you can use it in yours tough trials enable us to wait on God they enable us to wait on God now I'm going to give you two verses and these are bookends from my life in this season all right Psalm 27 verses 13 through 14 David says I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living wait for the Lord Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And then Psalm 8411 is the bookend. Psalm 8411 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. So can I tell you how that shows up in my life? This is practical. You can actually apply this to your life today. When you find yourself drifting into bitterness and frustration over a situation in your life that has not changed and you know you have no power to change it, on the one hand, you can pray, God, I'm going to wait on you. I will wait for you, Lord. However long it takes, I will wait. And on the other hand, Because there's no good thing you're going to withhold from me if I walk in obedience with you. Now, when he says no good thing, that does not mean if I walk uprightly and wait long enough, he's going to give me exactly what I want. It means he's going to give give us exactly what is best. So to, to, to put those two together, waiting on God prepares you to receive his very best. So we can wait. I can, I, there was a time this week for, for about 10 seconds, I was just overwhelmed with this frustration on something that I desperately want to change that I can't. And I said, God, I need an anchor verse. Give me something. And I'm telling you, he put this word in my heart that I had read in a devotional time weeks ago. And so I, I called it out loud. I will wait for your best. I will wait for your best. I will wait for your best. And I will say this, that night I had the sweetest night of sleep I have had in a long time because I know he's working on something good and it's better than I would have chosen for myself and it's not going to come in my time and I don't know exactly what it's going to be, but he's a good father and he will do what's best for the children that leave the decisions up to him. Believe it. So how do I sum this up in one sentence? I don't care how bad your trial is. This is one uh, 
powerful thing that you need to cling to in this time. Our most thankful thought must be that Jesus already suffered our toughest trial and exchanged it for his greatest gift. Our most thankful thought must be that Jesus already suffered our toughest trial and exchanged it for his greatest gift. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For our sake, he, meaning God the Father, made him, meaning Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ said, I'm going to face your toughest trial for you. I'm going to be condemned for your sin. And for everyone who trusts in me, I'm going to take that awful trial and I'm going to produce the greatest gift. I'm going to give you my righteousness so that you are declared innocent and perfect before a holy God and you can enter into his heavenly kingdom and have eternal fellowship with him forever. No matter how bad your trial is, your worst trial has already been taken care of. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So we could be thankful. We could be thankful. Can, can I say the highest degree of worship, the highest degree of worship is when you can thank God in advance for things that only make sense in reverse. You can thank God for what's going to happen before you can see it with your own eyes. Right? The Bible says set your mind on things above. When you live in that realm and you can see God at work and you can thank him for a blessing before you have received that blessing, that is such a high degree of worship. I'll leave you with an illustration. In fact, it was um, Miss Linda Newham gave this to me years ago and I just remembered it. And she, didn't, she, she got it from Chuck Swindoll. I'm sure he got it from somebody else, right? We all steal from each other. As Adrian Rogers says, I milk a lot of cows, but I churn my own butter. Well, I'm going to milk Chuck Swindoll's cow for a second. He says that God gives us two hands. And we need to remember that every time we pray, God has two hands. The first hand is to deliver us. And the second hand is to sustain us. And we should pray for the desires of our heart that he would come and deliver us from whatever trial that we're in in life. All right, sometimes we pray a hundred times and it's that hundredth prayer that finally cracks the rock. And God says, this trial has served its purpose and he delivers us. But if he says not right now, we need to hear what he said to Paul. If I don't deliver you, I'm going to sustain you. For my grace is sufficient and my power is made perfect in weakness. And this trial is producing for you an eternal weight of glory that you will not see until you enter into glory. And because of that, Cedar Street, because of that, whether it's a good gift or a tough trial, you and I can be eternally thankful. And if, those, if we can thank him in our thoughts, that gratitude will enter out of our mouths and it will be the posture of our lives. So let's have thankful thoughts in ever-changing times as we walk with the Lord. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for your word. It gives life. I thank you for the, the anchor that you gave me this week that I will wait on you because there is no good thing that you will withhold from those who walk uprightly, Lord. And I want to walk uprightly with you more than I want to receive a good gift. And I pray that for this church, Lord, that we wouldn't waste a trial that we wouldn't be confused in our suffering, that we would be fervent in prayer, hopeful, anchored in who you are, anchored in what your perfect plan is, and trusting that all things are working together for good, even if our eyes cannot see it. Oh, Father, be with us. Help us. Forgive us for all of our lack of gratitude and thanksgiving for all the good gifts that have come from your hand, Lord. I pray that we would be the, the grandchildren on Christmas morning and everything you give us, that so we, we would open it and see it as coming from your hand and we would run into your arms before we even finish unwrapping the wrapping paper and say thank you because you are good, you do good, and you work all things together for good. 
And for all these things, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.